Hello, Hope Community Church. Uh, my name is Katie Ridd, and I'm excited to be uh, able to say hello to you virtually. I am so sorry we are unable to meet in person. Uh, I have a poster behind me. It's the Endless Summer poster, and I feel like we are in a bit of an endless monsoon season right now. Um, but we will be able to gather again soon, and I look forward to when we can see each other in person and worship outside together. Um, but until then, I have some great announcements for the community. The first is that we're starting a new series today with our new year, and that series, uh, it doesn't revolve around, but we are using this book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, as a tool to help us grow in emotional and spiritual health using the Bible, using scripture, using our relationship with God to guide us. And this book is a tool and something that we're using together, uh, and we will have opportunities to process this information in small groups as well as uh, with kind of book buddies, book companions. So if you're interested in getting the book, looking into the book, um, or processing through the book with a friend, and you need a little help doing that, just reach out to us. We would love to be a guide. Um, and we're excited to walk through this together as we uh, begin our new year. Um, but let's take a step back before we even look forward. I have another great announcement, which is that uh, we just finished up the year in our Giving Hope season, which means that we were able to distribute funds to three ministries that are very close to the Hope community heart. And we were able to give away just shy of $4,000 uh, to those ministries, and we're so grateful for the generosity of Hope Community and the ability to share this with the community we live in as well as the folks in Nicaragua. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, your funds helped uh, the Help Hub of Wilmington, our ministry work in Nicaragua, as well as Vigilant Hope. So thank you. It's really incredible. The generosity of this church always astounds me, and I know our community is grateful as well. And uh, so speaking of generosity, uh, before we get into the sermon and worship, uh, we will have a slide that comes up with some information on how you can give and continue to give to the church. Uh, we are just so grateful as a staff and a community, and uh, it is just such an incredible thing to witness and be a part of the generosity of this church. And so without further ado, uh, we will be entering into worship. Thank you all so much from the bottom of my heart, and I cannot wait to see you all soon. Um, there's a question that uh, I get asked maybe every day, several times a day, that for some reason has been a hard question um, for me to answer. And in this season, uh, in the last 10 months, I feel like it's been especially hard to answer. And here's the question. How are you? <laughs> People just say, how are you? It's kind of just a greeting we use. Um, but for some reason, you know, someone says, are you well? Well... How, how do I answer that? And so the quick answer is, right, what we, you, you just say, fine, do, doing good. We are well. Um, but the truth is, if you come to me and you say, Nate, how are you? I kind of like freeze for a second because I'm thinking, well, not sure, kind of. Um, or, or I'm thinking, what part of me are you asking? So when you say, how are you? Are you talking about my body? Are you talking about my finances? Are you talking about my relationships? Are you talking about my faith? What do you mean? Because they're different. Some are doing well, some are not doing well. Um, and so what's interesting is in January, even though this is a different kind of January, people launch into January as kind of wellness month, right? People have purchased their Pelotons and their air fryers and, you know, making big changes, got their new devotional books and all these kinds of things. Um, but we realize as Christians, as followers of Jesus, as the church, that wellness is so much more than abs um, and cholesterol, that when we talk wellness, uh, it is physical, it is social, it is intellectual, it is emotional. Um, I think about these different you know, parts of who we are, and it was really my first internship in ministry, I was 22 years old, and the pastor of that church had a staff meeting and made an announcement and it was a smaller church, but that that church would be paying for a gym membership for anyone who wanted it, regardless of your position, custodian to senior pastor, uh, a gym membership. And also, if you ever needed any kind of counseling, the church would help pay for that. 
And then obviously the church was helping with spiritual health. That pastor drew this string through our spiritual, emotional, and physical health and said, the string is connected. All these things are connected. And as one goes down and the other goes down, they, they influence each other. So we have to pay attention, this pastor was saying. His name is George. George said, you have to pay attention to your emotional, spiritual, and physical health. God made us that way um, with these different components. If you look at Genesis 1, in the very beginning of the creation, God created us male and female, so there's a physicalness of us. And then he created us in his image. Spiritual and emotional, God made us in his image. And so those are all those components of, of how, how God made us. We're not just spiritual or just physical people. We're all those things. And I remember as a young kid, you know, as a boy, you know, wanting to wrestle and fight with other boys and that kind of stuff. You know, there is this thing you would say, you know, someone might come to you and say, do you want a piece of me? And the coolest line ever to respond to, do you want a piece of me is, no, nah, man, I don't want a piece of you. I want the whole thing, you know, and all your friends would be like, ooh, it's on. But I think about that because I think about our relationship with God. God doesn't want a piece of us. God doesn't just want this spiritual part of us. God made all of us and wants all of us. He doesn't want a piece. Uh, God wants the whole thing. And so this whole series called Be Well is about the whole thing. It's about life as God intended it to be, thinking about each component of who we are as children of God. It's seven weeks of a scriptural journey um, on what it means to be well or to be whole. So that's what we're going to be doing. Um, the Bible will be our primary source. You'll see today, Matthew 26 is where we're going. But this book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, is a tool. It's a resource. It's not infallible. It's just a good book that I think has been very helpful to me and many other leaders and Christians I know. So I thought this would be good for us um, as a church. And so this first sermon is a little bit 101 setup intro. So you kind of get where we're going for the rest of the series. So let me pray for us, and we're going to jump into the Gospel of Matthew uh, chapter 26. Let's pray. God, as we begin this journey, um, may we start with this deep gratification and gratitude of who you are and how you've made us, and that you've made us to feel, and you've made us to believe, and to trust, and to serve, and, and all these components of, of who we are. And may we pay attention to those so that we might be well and be whole. And by your Spirit, God, would you lead us in this journey, even into some of those places that are harder to talk about. God, go before us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Uh, amen. Okay, so here's the context. It's the scene in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, many of you are thinking, Nate, you just went like four weeks hard or five weeks hard on the incarnation, the birth of Christ, and now you're going all the way to the end of Jesus' life. You're right. Matthew 26, he's in the garden. Here's what's happening. In this very powerful scene leading up to it, Jesus is fully aware that there is a plot to kill him. He's fully aware that Judas has betrayed him. He's fully aware that Peter, one of his closest, says, I'll never leave you hanging. And Jesus knows that he will. And so all of this is weighing on Jesus as he goes into the garden. And as he comes out of the garden, uh, he will be arrested and face trial. And so when we say things like, you know, this unprecedented time, if you want to look at the life of Jesus, this is an unprecedented time. And it's a moment that some people don't know quite know what to do with Jesus in this scene. And I find it super helpful. So verse 26, or 36 of chapter 26 in Matthew. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, and by the way, Gethsemane is like a garden park, like a park next to, it's a Jerusalem's park, like a city park connected to the Mount of Olives. Beautiful place where Jesus went. Uh, and he, he called to the other disciples. He said, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the sons of Zebedee along with him. So Peter, James, and John. And he began uh, to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Think about that. Jesus said that. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further or farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, 
My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. And by, by cup, it's may this responsibility, may this task be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch for me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it's not possible for this cup or responsibility to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Okay, let's stop there and let's pay attention to these components of Jesus. There is so much in this text. But listen to this. I'm going to go quickly back to the top, verse 36. He said, sit here while I go and pray. So one major component you see in Jesus, first off, is a spiritual component. He's going to go spend time with the Father. Verse 37. He took three others with him, Peter, James, and John. He's demonstrating another component the communal relational component that not only Jesus had, but he's demonstrating that we need to have the component of the spiritual with the Father and the relational with other people. Verse 38, my soul is overwhelmed to death. And a lot of us have been saying statements like, we're so overwhelmed, you know, it's just like, ugh, can we even go on? And Jesus says that here. He, he shows us this emotional component, that Jesus was full of, of emotion. The sin of the world would be on top of Jesus. That he would be facing, and he knew it in a couple days, horrible death, gruesome death. And so he's overwhelmed. Verse 39, he fell. So he shows this kind of physical part of Jesus. He falls and he says twice in this section, if you read it, twice he says, will you take this cup, this responsibility? This is too much. I'm overwhelmed. Ugh. Do, you know, do I have to do this, Father? And so in that, just there, is this spiritual and emotional. He shows up before the Father, honest about his emotions, how he's feeling. And then he comes back, you know, and there's more. Verse 40, he sees these sleeping disciples. Twice he, they fall asleep. And, and, and it's this emotional thing. He's frustrated with his team. They're, they're supposed to be doing something for the kingdom of God, and they're, they're fast asleep. He shows frustration towards people he loves. In verse 41, he said, you know, don't fall into temptation because the spirit is willing, but the flesh or the body is weak. And just in that statement, so many components, if you look at what he's saying by the spirit, he's talking about a spiritual component and flesh and body is a physical component, component and an emotional component. So he's saying, pay attention to all those things and the role they play in you. So why am I emphasizing the spiritual and emotional aspects of Jesus in this scene? Well, here's why. Don't forget, and we talk about this a lot at Hope, the goal of discipleship. So as the follower of Jesus, once you've committed your life to Christ, trusted Christ, the goal in discipleship is Christ-likeness or maturity. That's what we're called to be about. And big components are spiritual maturity and is so deeply connected to our emotional maturity. And Jesus is the template, right, for spiritual and emotional maturity. Um, you know, in this scene, Jesus deals with his emotions. He sits in the place of pain. And a, a little rabbit trail, you know, I get a little frustrated because it's like still in our culture, we hear this language of women are too emotional and men don't have any emotions. And we all have emotions. And we look at Jesus, Son of God, Right, fully God, fully human, with healthy emotions, expressing his emotions to the Father. Not posting it all over Facebook or anything like that, but expressing these deep emotions in prayer to the Father. And so, you know, if you think about, um, do y'all remember Flat Stanley, that like piece of paper that had a little guy on it and I think he mailed it around and stuff? Jesus is not Flat Stanley, um, and nor are we. We are not one-dimensional people. And we have to remember that as we think about our spiritual health. Uh, the entire scene that we just read is a picture of spiritual and uh, emotional maturity. So here's kind of this big idea that is a little bit of uh, a gut punch. But the big idea is this, is you cannot be spiritually mature 
which is the goal of discipleship. You cannot be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. And that's the premise of the book we'll be reading on the side. You cannot be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. Uh, and this is convicting if you'll let it be, right? This will get up in your chili, up in your grill, which is a good thing. That's where change happens is, is when we're pushed. So let me give you just some quick examples, and you can probably think of a bunch. But the example in, in this book is a, it's written by a pastor whose wife came to him and said, I no longer want to be a part of your church. You might preach well and you might lead well, but when it comes to your emotional health that comes into the home and how you treat us, I'm not going to be a part of that church. I'm going to a different church. Let me just tell you that as a pastor, to have your spouse go to another church is not exactly a vote of confidence, right? You have to deal with something. There's something going on there. I'm aware of a seminary professor who taught ethics and was caught in the middle of the night cutting down one of the oldest trees on campus because it blocked his view out of his window, right? There's a little bit of a gap there. Um, many people will talk about stories of why they aren't Christians because of the religious relative or neighbor or friend or boss who is all about their faith or their church, but they were controlling or emotionally unavailable or manipulative or judgmental. There's a gap there. You know, there's people who have great attendance in church. There's people who are devoted to their devotions and all these other things and yet have held on to bitterness for 20 some years, not willing to forgive. There's a, there's a gap there. Uh, for me, I remember someone with a Christian fish on the back of their minivan and I cut them off in traffic uh, as an accident. They pulled beside me, screaming and yelling and waving at me with one finger and uh, there's a gap there. Like, what, what's that about? And then um, many of us can think about probably committed Christians to the church, to the faith, who just can't keep healthy relationships with other people. They can't maintain a healthy relationship with other people. There's a gap there. Um, the pastor of Hope Community, Nate Stratman, can actually teach and preach pretty well on grace. But I can come into this very home and not extend that grace to a person that I've covenanted my love to, my wife, and to my children. There's a gap there, right? There's a, a gap in the spiritual and emotional health. And so this, my friends, is what I'm calling the elephant in the sanctuary, that we as a church need to pay attention to these gaps because other people see them, the world sees them. Uh, Gallup polls did research, and one of the ends of their research basically said this, that evangelical Christians are as likely to embrace lifestyles every bit as hedonistic or pleasure-seeking and materialistic and self-centered and sexually immoral as the world in general. So the research was saying people aren't seeing the difference. And again, there's a connection between spiritual and emotional health there. And so the two images I'm going to use probably a lot, or I just think about in my head, one is that sometimes I've referred to myself in different phases as a soft boiled egg, right? You look firm on the outside, but a little gushy on the inside that something needs addressed. Or, you know, around here, you got a lot of boats that sit in the water. They can look really clean and maintained, but under the water line, there could be barnacles eight inches thick all over that thing. And so those are kind of two images as we think about barnacles and soft boiled egg. And, and what we have are really two options. When we notice some of these things that are underformed or un under addressed, we can ignore them for sure. We can go on kind of doing Christian-y activities and whatnot. And that's part of our, you know, if you want to say like our Christian heritage with Adam and Eve, that they started hiding and running since the get-go. And this idea of hiding from God, like he can only see this part of me, but not this part of me, you know, is a ridiculous idea, but we, we do it. So we can ignore it or we can address it. We can actually say, hey, there's barnacles on the boat. Or, hey, I think this egg is a little runnier than intended. Hey, I think there's some anger in me. I think there's some ways I treat people I love that I think I need to pay attention to. There's places in my soul and my personality and my past that are untouched by Jesus. Now, that are some, those are some images we need to sit with for a second. 
So here are just some closing thoughts. I'm going to give two closing thoughts and a little bit of an action item. The first one is this. You all know this, but God often gets our attention through pain. So it seems like the Father had full attention of the Son, of Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane because there was pain there. And if you listen to stories and people talk to you of real life change, I mean real life change, you're going to hear some aspect of pain in there. So why would someone want to get physically well? Why would someone want to get emotionally well? Why would someone want to get spiritually well? The reason is because something hurts, right? Because there's pain, because um, something is missing. And so Write this question down. Think about this question this week. Is there a pain, emotional, physical, spiritual, that God might actually be using to get your attention, that he might be using in your life and in your community for some reason to draw people unto himself? The second kind of idea is this, is that there is a connection between wellness, this whole series, what we're looking at, and God's will. So two times in this section, Jesus says, essentially, not my will, but your will. God, may your will be done. Jesus' deepest desire is that in the midst of pain, Jesus' deepest desire in the midst of like the worst days is that God's will would be done. And I want to say that's mine too. It doesn't always look that way, but that should be ours too, is in the midst of pain, God's will. And, and to remember this, God's will, to do God's will, requires wellness, right? We need spiritual and emotional wellness to be able to, to do God's will that he's called us to do as the church, as the people of God. Another way to say it is that the mission requires maturity, Right? You, you can't complete the mission of Jesus being a bunch of immature people. So we're still being formed in Christ. I don't care if you're 70 or 80. You're still being formed if you'll show up, if you'll have hands open by Jesus. That's what we're called to do. Personally, I, I don't want to be well to simply feel well or look well, even though those are nice attributes or fruits. I want to be spiritually and emotionally well to be useful in the kingdom of God. That's why I want to be well. That's why I want you uh, to be well as well. And so I just would love to do this journey together. I know people are joining us from other places and excited to kind of do this. Some are apprehensive. I don't know about all this emotional stuff. We're just talking about overall health that God has called us to and it will stretch you. So if you don't want to be stretched, do not do this. But I I believe this will be a great journey. And the next faithful step that you can take, that I'm taking too, I'm I'm doing this whole thing again. I've read this book. This will be my third time. The first step is really to take some inventory and to go back at the very beginning to answer the question, how am I? How am I spiritually? How am I emotionally? How am I relationally? All these components that matter to Jesus. How am I? And the question is, it's a great one. Write it down and answer it. What is untouched by Jesus? Right? What are the barnacles? Name the barnacles that need to be addressed. But what in you is below the waterline and untouched by Jesus? And here is the good news. Please hear this. My admission that I am unwell, so when I look at my life and say, there's parts of me that are unwell, when I actually can admit that, I'm not saying that I'm not a Christian. I'm saying a Christian who needs greater health, right? So when I admit that I'm unwell, that's not a weak statement. It's actually a faithful statement because here's what happens when you admit to to areas that need to be addressed to being unwell. It puts greater dependence on the Father. It puts greater dependence on the Father, which is what our Father longs for. What is Christianity? Dependence on God. And this is what happens when we say, ah, I don't have this together. I need to lean in and press into Jesus. We put dependence on the Father. And so I encourage you, uh, if you have not gotten this book, I think it's helpful. Read chapters one and two and listen to this message, you know, alongside. 
maybe find someone to do this with, at least do it by yourself, but to just have a book buddy could be helpful to, to walk through some of this stuff. And I just ask that you would journey, uh, join me on this journey of healing and health and wholeness and that God's spirit would be in the midst of us as we walk forward. Let's pray. Lord God, we are deeply grateful that you've made us the way you've made us. And God, I pray in this, this next season in 2021 that we would um, pay deep attention to our spiritual walk with you, to our emotional health, and to our physical health, so that we might be extra useful in the kingdom. And that's what we long to be, that we might be aware of where you're at work and where we long for you to be at work in our lives and around us and in our world. And so God, do some work in us, even in the hard places, stretch us. And we long uh, for this wholeness that only you can give us. And we pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Um, if you have not already grabbed some form of um, juice or wine um, or whatever you have, liquid or bread or quesadilla or cracker, uh, you can pause right now and go ahead and do that. But I think it's important uh, that we keep celebrating the Eucharist together, communion, the sacraments, um, even if we have to do it in this way. And so one particular thing about the sacrament that I just want to remind you of is this sacrament reminds us of all kinds of things, but it reminds us of our dependence on Jesus, right? So we have to depend on Christ for salvation. We get it no other way, but we also keep depending on Christ for maturity and wholeness and for our identity, who we are. We keep depending on Jesus. And so we show up in a very tangible way. You can touch and taste and smell these things as this deep reminder, a core identity of what we believe that Christ died for us so that we might be saved and have full and free lives and, and be able to participate in kingdom work that he's called us to be a part of. And so this anchors us, it reminds us, it centers us, which is what we need more than anything in 2021 is to be centered on Christ. This is what Christians need, long for. And so I want to remind you that it's this great scene of the Last Supper towards the end of Jesus' life again, where he gets these disciples together. And, and he, uh, at this dinner table, whatever it might look like, at this Last Supper table, and he said to them, uh, as he picked up bread, he said that this is my body and it's been broken for you. And every time you eat it, you need to remember me, is what he said to them. And in the same way, he picked up a cup and he poured it out. And, and he, he reminded them that this is about the removal or remission of our sins. And so every time we drink from the cup, we remember Christ. We remember him. Um, and it was Paul who says that this is basically a proclamation. You are making a bold proclamation as a believer in Jesus. So as Christians come to the table, you make a proclamation that Christ has died and Christ will come again, that, that this is a saving death of the resurrected Lord. That's what you're proclaiming. And so that he will redeem and restore all things. It's a powerful meal that centers us. So receive these words, and then Eric is going to play a song uh, that I love to play at the beginning of the year every year. Um, but remember these words, that Christ's body has been broken for you, and Christ's blood has been shed for you. So go ahead and take the elements and sit and listen to these words of the song as we continue to worship. Should nothing of our effort stand, no legacy survive, unless the Lord does raise the house in vain its builders strive to you who boast tomorrow's gain tell me what is your life amidst that vanishes at dawn all glory be to Christ
thank God just for the gift of communion, for the gift of his life for us. And I just pray in this week as you go forward, ask some of these questions. What needs to be touched by Jesus? What is untouched by Jesus? What needs to be healed or made whole? And let's continue to do this journey together uh, as we begin and, and continue to reflect the likeness of Jesus. Go with the peace of Jesus and have a great week. Hello, Hope. Uh, I know some of you probably have questions about all this cancellation we've had with rain. Um, we've had some good good runs with good weather, and then recently it hasn't really gone in our favor. And so I decided to take a second to explain to you the process because there actually is a lot that happens um, as we end up canceling in the field. The first, uh, just so you'd know, there's a million calls and texts between the Risleys and the elders. Uh, we are watching every weather channel, weather underground, Jim Cantor. I mean, we're looking at local stuff. And um, the big deal is this, even if it's not currently raining, which all of our calls, when we've made the call, it has rained at the time of worship uh, in Castle Hain. But bigger than that really is the saturation of the field. So this time of year where it's colder and there's a lot of water, the fields just get saturated. So I get pictures from Steve that looks like he could go fishing in parts of their field and any kind of car driving through there would rut it up. Even their small little Kubota, their little farm machine thing can, can really rut up the field. And so all those cars, two wheel drive cars, digging people out. And there's really not a great place to park out there that's not in a field when it's that saturated and that wet. If it was the summertime, it wouldn't be as big of a deal. But that's what we're dealing with. On top of that, you have electricity. We're running electrical stuff. You got musical instruments out there. You just put all that stuff together and sometimes big time wind. And it just, just makes sense to, to call it. And the last thing we want to do is we're borrowing this uh, property. We don't want to tear up someone else's place. So that's been part of the call. Um, a couple things just to know is canceling um, for the staff is not easier. So 
If anyone were thinking like, oh, that's just the easy way to do it, it actually causes chaos. We try to make a call in the afternoon on Saturdays, which then means we've got to kind of scramble to record the sermon early, and uh, Eric's recording music today, uh, and some announcements, and then we have to get it edited, and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of work that we've done gets undone, and we have to redo work. So um, it's much more fun for us to be in person with you all and, and not to cancel. And it's much more, it's easier actually to do it in person. The second thing is we as elders, the elder team just does not believe as we, as we talk with our people in our church that we're quite ready to go back in a building. Uh, if we were to go back in a building, we believe that a, a large percentage of our uh, people for different reasons uh, would, not, uh, would not go. And so for now, we're going to remain with this same plan. But I will say we need to start thinking about some alternative places, maybe parking lots or something we can go where even if it's raining, it's not saturated. So. We're going to start doing that and be thinking through that. But just so you know, we are putting in effort and time to, to think how to do this. And it's, it's a bummer every time we have to cancel it. But we, we think it's the best, best call, even though it's not the most fun call. So I appreciate your patience and just continue to show up when we can. And your giving and all that stuff just um, shows me a great sign of spiritual health in our church. And I'm grateful for it. Okay, have a great day.